But what's beautiful is when you feel safe enough to show up fully and honestly, I feel like conflict can truly bring about positive change and evolution and awareness. Hey, my name is Jenna Kutcher, and I am obsessed with all things business, marketing, numbers, and helping you to navigate both the messy and the magical seasons of this thing called life. I'm a small town mama who took a $300 camera, grew a successful photo biz, and now I work from home and run a seven figure online business. I teach you the tried and true secrets to building a career you adore. Shy away from the real talk? (laughs) No way. Money, hardship, growth, loss, and marketing are all topics we discuss here. Think of this as your one stop shop for happy hour with a gal pal mixed with business school. Pull up a seat, make sure you're cozy, and get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn. This is the Gold Digger Podcast. Who here avoids conflict at all costs? I know, just the thought of facing conflict head on is enough to make a lot of people squirm in their seats. And yet conflict is an unavoidable part of human life. Like anything else, developing an approach and practicing that approach can help you feel confident when it comes time to step into the ring and tackle conflict in any area of life, from personal to professional and even conflict within yourself. That's what we're digging into on this episode of the Gold Digger podcast. We actually talked about conflict and resolution during a recent session of Growth Day. Growth Day, if you don't know what it is, is an online group coaching platform featuring live sessions from some of the most incredible voices in the personal development space. I'm talking Brendan Burchard, Mel Robbins, Anthony Trucks, Gloatan Mo. We speak on topics like confidence, relationships, focus and productivity, and so much more. And it's the only place I show up and live coach every single month. If you want to try it out for free for 15 days, visit growthday.com slash Jenna. That's growthday.com slash Jenna. Now the topic of conflict was just too important to not share with you. So here it is. I'll walk you through what it means to protect your peace, why it's important to determine how you process issues, the meaning of intentional listening, the power of harnessing humility, and more. Are you ready for some conflict and resolution? Let's dive on in. It's so cool to be podcasting alongside my business BFF and the woman who inspired me to start my own show. Amy Porterfield is the host of the online marketing Made Easy podcast brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network. With a focus on online business, including digital courses, email list building, social media, webinars, and content, Online Marketing Made Easy breaks down big ideas and strategies into actionable step-by-step processes and is designed to get you more results with a whole lot less stress. If you love listening to the Gold Digger podcast, then you'll love these episodes from Amy. Normalizing mental health for entrepreneurs, thriving as an introvert in an extrovert career, and what happens when a launch doesn't go as planned. Listen to Online Marketing Made Easy wherever you get your podcasts. So I want to kick this off with a story, and my mom loves to remind me of this story often. And I was an angsty third grader, and she was dropping me off at school one day, and she told me that I couldn't go to a friend's house after school. And as an angsty third grader, I said, Mom, you make my life a living hell, and I slammed the door. And I walked away. And this was not normal Jenna behavior. And the next thing that followed was, so I walked out to the playground and I felt awful. I felt terrible. And I asked the aide, I said, I need to go inside and I need to call my mom. And this was before cell phone. So I had to wait about the five minutes it would take for my mom to get home. And the aide said, did you forget something? Did you forget your backpack? And I said, I need to call her to tell her I'm sorry. I have always hated conflict, even from when I was a little girl. I was that person that my mom would say, you know, never go to bed angry. And man, did I live that way? And do I still live that way? And I remember going into the front office and the receptionist, and I kind of turned away, held the phone. I didn't want her to hear. And I just said, mom, I'm so sorry. I said that I didn't mean it. I was just mad. And it really, that story just brought up all of these emotions when I was thinking about conflict, because I think for a lot of us in our lives, we are constantly dealing with or processing conflict, yet we're not always able to pick up the phone and resolve it within five minutes flat, right? 
We're living in this state of conflict day in and day out. And it's up to us how we start to move forward and process it or how we can learn, grow and evolve because of it. So whenever I do research for these trainings, I always want to kind of look at what some of the experts say, because I am only an expert in my lived experience. And let me tell you, recently, I've been living in the experience of conflict as a divine download so that I can be able to share what I have been learning in hopes that it will help you learn something too. So there's this quote from Peter Coleman. He is the executive director of Columbia University's Advanced Cooperation, Conflict, and Complexity Center. And he said, the point of conflict is not to prove who is right and who is wrong, but to come to a resolution together. And I don't know about you, but when I hear the word resolution, it's almost like this exhale. Like resolution feels like when you finally unclench your jaw after not realizing that you've had it clenched for weeks on end, or when you finally take that deep breath and you realize that you haven't actually been like filling up your belly with air. And so today I want to cover both conflict, but I want for us to kind of shift the lens and really think about conflict, not just with other people, but also conflict within ourselves. Because I have been experiencing this firsthand. Last night, my three-year-old Coco woke up in the middle of the night. And literally for the last two years, I cannot even complain because she has slept through the night for so very long. But last night, she woke up calling for me. And after the third time of going down to her room and singing Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, I laid in bed next to her. And we just lay there for two and a half hours as she asked me every question under the sun why the moon is yellow, what the Northern Hemisphere is, why do people sleep? Why do we lay down when we sleep? And I woke up this morning and I was so conflicted because I had a day full of work. And as I was laying there with her last night, I was thinking, you know, next week I have a work trip. And like, how can I possibly leave my family? Like, how can I leave my children? Am I doing the right thing? And is this work this important or should I say no or should I say yes or, you know, and I was thinking about conflict. And when I initially thought about the training, I was thinking of it from like a standpoint of conflict with your partner or a coworker. But this morning, I feel like life was like conflict happens within us. And honestly, the majority of conflict that we're likely facing is stewing in us on a daily basis where it leaves us questioning, am I doing the right thing? Am I doing enough? Am I answering the call? Why can I not do that thing I said I was going to do? And I think that a lot of times when we let conflict live within ourselves, we face our days processing guilt or shame or uncertainty or fear. And this morning, as I was sitting there just exhausted and and thinking about life and laughing at the fact that when I finally got Coco back into bed, then the baby was waking up and Quinn needed me. And I was like, I just am all over the place and spread too thin, but my life is so full all at the same time. I recognize that conflict is this push and pull in our lives. And it's up to us how we look at it, how we process it, how we use it to propel us forward. Now, I was listening to a TED Talk on conflict, and the person that was delivering it was named Robin Funston, and she was talking about how conflict can be this positive thing in our life. But I don't know about you, but when I hear the word conflict, I tense up. I'm like, oh, let's just avoid it at all costs. But she talked about how conflict usually has three parts, emotions, logic, and empathy. Now, when I think about conflict, whether it's within myself or within a relationship, emotions usually lead the way, right? We are so in it. And this morning I was on Instagram and I was like, I'm probably going to delete these stories later, but like, I'm just so emotional thinking about like, am I doing the right thing? How can I balance it all? How can I do it all? And what I love about this season of my life is uh, I have a book coming out at the end of June and I committed in writing my book, How Are You Really?, to living out the mission in the pages. And man, has that commitment challenged me every single day. But part of the message, part of the the meaning behind How Are You Really? is not just leaning into conversations with other people, but more so leaning into conversation with ourselves. 
how am I really? And getting quiet enough with ourselves to actually answer that question honestly. So what I want to walk you through are the seven pieces that I think need to be a part of our process, whether it is resolving conflict with the people that we love or resolving conflict within ourselves. The first one has been a cornerstone in my life and my career for so long, and it is so simple, but it is something we so often forget, and that is protecting our peace. Now, one of our friends, Trent Shelton, who is amazing, always talks about protecting your peace. And I have learned that when it comes to conflict, if something is stealing my peace, it's too expensive, right? If something is costing me my peace, it is too expensive. And so when I look at conflict, if something is keeping me up in the middle of the night, it is a sign that I need to address it either within myself or within the relationship. And a lot of times we let things stew for way too long. I want to give an example. A few weeks ago, I was with one of my dear friends and I made just a silly, stupid remark. She wasn't drinking that night and I was joking around and I was like, oh, are you pregnant? And I was like, why am I of all people saying something like that when I know how sensitive of a topic it was? And it just like popped out of my mouth. And I sat there for like the next two hours thinking, oh my gosh, is she mad at me? Did I offend her? That was so insensitive. What was I thinking? And later that night, I like went up to her and I like hugged her and I was like, gosh, I got to apologize to you. Like, I don't even know why that came out of my mouth. That was the dumbest thing that I think I've said in a very long time. And I say a lot of dumb things. And I was like, I am so sorry. And she was like, oh, I didn't even think like, I know you, I know your heart. Like you meant nothing. You were just being funny. And I knew that if I had not apologized in that moment, I would have lost sleep over it that night, right? Have you ever had that where you're overthinking something? And maybe the other person was like, hey, right off my back, it slid right over me. And my friend, that was how she reacted. But I was like, I know I would have literally sat up that night and been like, she's mad at me. I was an idiot. I said something I shouldn't have said. And so when we start with protecting our peace, It's something that we have to level up with this self-awareness of like, is this something that I am going to keep rehearsing or mentally rehearsing or going over in my brain over and over and over again? And is that going to rob my joy or steal my energy? And if the answer is yes on those things, it's a really good sign that you've got to address the conflict. The second piece of this is processing. So Drew and I have been doing this app called Paired. It's not sponsored. It's an app that is a couple app that asks you a question every single day. And it's kind of like Tinder for relationships in that you cannot see the person's response until you yourself have responded. So it gamifies these delicate conversations that you might need to be having with your partner. It covers all different realms. And we had this one question on it and it was like, how do you feel about handling arguments over text? And Drew wrote, I hate it. Why do we do that? We can just sit in the same room. And I type in my response. I haven't seen his. I type in my response and I was like, I love it. It gives me time to like step away from the emotion and like think about my words and hit backspace 800 times before I send a message that I don't actually mean. And we were laughing so hard because I'm like, we have been together for like 15 years and we didn't know that each other enjoyed or hated this way of processing. And so the second piece is how do you process best and how can you bring that self-awareness to a conflict where you can be really honest about the fact like, do I need space? Do I need to resolve this immediately? And be aware of your urges that happen around conflict, like my third grade self needing to call my mom within five minutes to resolve it because I hate being in conflict, so that you can understand that the person you're in conflict with might actually process differently than you do. I have one of my members of my team. She is my right-hand girl. She is so irreplaceable in my life. Her and I process very differently. So if her and I come upon conflict, I'm like, let's just sit down. Let's get it over with. Let's talk it out. And she's like, I need space. I need a little bit of time to think about this. 
And that like drives me crazy because I'm like, no, 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 let's just, we can do this. Let's just process it. Let's just get through it. And so getting really honest about how do you process best, but also how can you honor the way the person you're in conflict with processes can absolutely transform conflict in your life. Now that Drew knows that I enjoy text messaging when him and I are in an argument, and now that I know that he doesn't enjoy that, we can kind of approach things with a little bit deeper of an understanding in how the other person processes, which invites us to show up a little bit more wholly in the way that we can show up best. There is this research that says that there are way more ways for you to respond to conflict than with just anger. Like anger is like step one of conflict a lot. There are so many different ways. And so the more that you know about yourself, the more that you can manage things like triggers or think about your emotions and those types of things can help you mitigate conflict. The more that you know about yourself, the higher the probability that you can hold yourself in check and come to the table with more than just emotion. And I think that's super important for us to remember. The third one, and this makes me laugh a little bit because last night I was literally trying to tell Drew these flights that I needed to take and I saw him drifting away and I was like, I need you to pay attention. I literally need you to look at me right now and pay attention. This is important. And it made me recognize the gift of intentional listening. So number three is intentional listening, both with yourself, but also with the other person. How can you give someone your undivided attention? What does that look like? We have never done formal marriage counseling, but a lot of times they say the advice is is to repeat back what that person just said to show that you clearly understand or to clarify where you are confused. I hear that you are telling me that when I do this, it makes you feel this way, right? Like just repeating that shows one, I'm intentionally listening, but two, I am receiving what you are saying. Drew and I have this act of like, once I'm done with work and we kind of enter into the same space at the end of the day or in the middle of the day, we do five minutes of undivided attention before we jump back into the logistics of nap time or bedtime or meal time or whatever it is that's happening. And That intentional listening, even just five minutes of it, can help you feel so much more connected. And I want to challenge you here in understanding that intentional listening isn't just in conversation with others, but it is also when we are talking about being in conflict with ourselves. One of the biggest things that I thought about when writing my book is how afraid we are to get quiet with ourselves. Does anyone relate with that? I have this story in my book about Shavasana. If you've ever done yoga, at the end of the practice, a lot of times you lay flat on the floor. And I hated Shavasana for so long. Uh, It pained me to be still with myself for five minutes. It was like my brain went into overdrive and I thought about all the things that I needed to do after yoga and I needed to get out of there and I would sing songs in my head. I would do everything to avoid being quiet with myself. And I literally had to teach myself how to be still. Being still requires just as much effort for me as going full steam ahead. Like going full steam ahead for me is autopilot. No worries. Resting takes a lot of work. So when we talk about intentionally listening, I want for us to think about, are we good at listening to ourselves? Like, can we ask ourselves, how am I really? And can we intentionally and without judgment, listen to the answers that come up? I feel like a lot of conversations I've been having with people lately are the honesty of saying like, I'm not happy. Or I know that a lot of people have it worse than I do, but I'm going through a hard time right now. Or I hate my job. I need a change. And so intentional listening is something that we have to gift ourselves, but also a piece of the puzzle when it comes to conflict and a very important one at that. The next piece is, is how do you communicate best? So I went to school. I was a communication major. That's where I met my husband, Drew. So you would think we would be excellent communicators after that four-year degree. But let me tell you, sometimes we are not. And I, as the girl who sometimes likes to resolve things via text message, I can write my thoughts sometimes better than I can express them. 
I am the kind of person I never post in real time on the internet because I need space from the moment to really ask myself, like, why does this matter? Or what was the meaning? Or how do I share this message? I I need space from the emotion of being a feeler so that I can clearly communicate with logic. Now, when you can come with the level of self-awareness of like, I communicate best through speaking, or I communicate best through writing, or I communicate best with space from the moment, or I communicate best when I'm emotional. When you can really show up and allow someone to understand how you communicate best, you are setting yourself up for so much more success. So now that Drew and I know how each other likes to handle conflict, we can now get to a resolution faster and offer opportunities for each other to express in the way they want to express. Last week, I love parenting. You guys know I talk about Coco all the time. Love parenting. Last week gave me a run for my freaking money. I thought I came out of terrible twos unscathed. Let me tell you, three is a whole new ball game. And Drew and I <laughs> were trying to like figure out how do we parent this deeply feeling child? Like she is a deep feeler. Oh, that girl. I just love her heart. But dang it, like when they say three nager, we got a glimpse at like what our lives are going to look like in 10 years. And we got real freaked out. I mean, there were so many moments where we would look at each other and be like, what happened to our child? What, what happened? What do we, do we mess up? What happened to our little girl? And Drew and I were not on the same page on certain things when it came to boundaries or how we were going to process emotions. Like we were not working together. And so we had to figure out what does communication look like? And more specifically, how do we communicate with one another in front of a child, right? I mean, if you have ever experienced parenting and there are eyeballs on you at all hours of the day, you got to get really good at communicating clearly with looks, with code words, potentially, with spelling, if they don't know how to spell yet. But Drew and I are like giving each other these looks of like, oh, dear God, like we have got to get on the same page here because This conflict between us and our child, but also us and each other, this is not a good situation for anyone. And so then we had to come to the next step, which was what does resolution look like? Now, getting really honest about what a relationship can look like with resolution is going to look different when it comes to conflict. If you are in conflict with a coworker, or a superior, if you are in conflict with a spouse or a partner, if you are in conflict with a child, all of those resolutions are going to look different. Now, something that I think is really important to note is as somebody who hates conflict and loves to resolve it, I love to just like hit the rewind button and be like, let's just go back to where we were before this conflict hit. But the older I get and the more that I see different forms of conflict showing up in life, Sometimes relationships change because of conflict. That change isn't always negative, but sometimes it's necessary. I was listening to a podcast the other day and it was about toxic relationships. And it was just really interesting to me because I feel like as people are navigating into what this new normal looks like, they are really looking at and almost taking an inventory of their lives and saying, what do I need to leave behind or what do I need to let go of? And sometimes when you resolve a conflict, it doesn't mean that you get to hit the rewind button and go back to before that conflict. Sometimes resolution means a changed relationship. Some relationships might be strengthened by conflict. Some might need repair, might take time. They might be damaged. But I want for you to think about not just how you can move on from conflict, because that's my natural tendency, but how you can move forward with it. I think about this in a sense of grief. So I have this line in my book about grief. And I think a lot of times when we go through grieving, which is very similar to kind of some of those feelings that come up when we go through conflict, we have this deep desire to just move on, right? Like we're like, okay, I'm just going to like sit down and I'm going to grieve and then I'm just going to move on. And I don't know about you, but in my experience of grief, you don't move on from grief. You have to learn how to move forward. 
You almost have to like pick up the grief and start to learn to move with it. And I feel like that some conflict inevitably is going to shape relationships in a way that you don't just move on, but you've got to learn what moving forward looks like. Some conflict means that relationships will be changed. And being really honest about that with the relationship that you're in and with the situation you find yourself in can sometimes provide you opportunities to create things like boundaries that will protect you. As a leader, you're always on the lookout for ways to arm yourself with knowledge, the books, the seminars, even the podcasts that help you make the best possible decisions for you and for your customers. Because when you know more, more good can grow. With the HubSpot CRM platform, you can store, track, manage, and report on all the tasks and activities that make up your relationships with customers. With a bird's eye view over all your customer interactions, HubSpot empowers your decision making like never before. So you can give your business and your customers all the good you've got. Learn how your business can grow better at HubSpot.com. True or false? Pinterest is just a social media site. Well, that's actually false. Pinterest is also a powerful search engine. And while you're busy pinning outfit inspiration, home decor, and the perfect margarita recipe, your people are trying to find you on the platform and they can't. Don't let them walk away with pinning your brilliance to their inspo boards. Let me give you my ultimate cheat sheet to Pinterest for free. In these seven pages, I'll walk you through Pinterest and show you why your business needs to be using the platform, not just for social purposes, but to drive intentional traffic to the things that you're working so hard on. My guide is free for gold diggers at jennacutcher.com slash alt Pinterest guide. That's jennacutcher.com slash ULT Pinterest guide for my advice on where to start and how to strategize Pinterest for your business. Happy pinning. The next one is my favorite because I've been practicing it a lot. How do we harness humility? (laughs) Like that story with my friend where I made that stupid, stupid, insensitive comment. I was faced with this moment of humility. It was actually hilarious. We were at a John Mayer concert. So like all the emotions of like being in this arena again, and there's live music and it's so good. And then I just feel like such a dummy for saying something so stupid and I'm hugging her and I'm like tearing up and she's like, girl, you are fine. What is happening? And I was like, I just, I I feel awful that I said that. And that was so dumb. And I, I recognize that there is this art of humility that accompanies conflict, whether internal or external. How can you show up with humility when you have messed up? I don't know about you, but when I am super emotional, humility doesn't always accompany the emotions. Humility usually comes later. And I think that that is why it is sometimes important that we take a little bit of space from a moment so that we can let the emotion subside so that we can feel those feelings, but then we can enter the room with logic and humility so that we can start to figure out how it is that we are going to move forward. I have had a lot of humility dealing with my beautiful toddler And showing her that mommy gets frustrated too, or mommy gets sad too. And I'm sorry that I didn't know how to handle this and showing her exactly what I want her to do. I want her to have humility. I want her to see it's okay to get frustrated. It's okay to get upset. It's okay to not know the answer to a question. And so I have been trying to lead with humility and admitting mom messed up or mom, what is up with mom today? Mom is a little stressed out and welcoming her into that acceptance of that. She is welcome to say, I got it wrong and I'm going to do exactly what I can the next time to get it better. Not always right, but to just do better. The last one is this, having a deeper understanding of the person you are in conflict with. And I'll, I'll run through the list again before we close out with one of my favorite mantras that I've been repeating a lot lately, but having a deeper understanding of the person that you are in conflict with. Drew and I have 
had this fascination with things like the Enneagram or Myers-Briggs or emotional intelligence tests. We recently did this DNA methylation test that helped give us more insight into why we are the way we are. And people might say that those things don't really do anything. But for me, it has helped me to understand my partner on a deeper level. If anyone is familiar with the Enneagram, Drew is a one. It's the perfectionist. And when I learned that about him, I learned that his inner narrative is constantly that of someone that feels like they're never doing things right, that there is a black and a white way of doing things and that you have to do it the right way or else you are failing. And I cannot relate to that narrative. That is not my narrative. My narrative is very differently. When I learned that about him, it totally transformed the way that I saw his inner conflict or even the way that he approached conflict with me. When you love somebody and when you have the opportunity or the invitation to understand them on a deeper level, it will absolutely transform the way you can be in conflict with them and not just be in conflict, but process that conflict. There are so many different tools out there these days that allow us to have a deeper understanding, not just for others, but for ourselves and literally send me any type of tool. I am going to be the person answering the 80 questions as honestly as I can, because I'm like, tell me why I am this way. (laughs) Help me to understand why I struggle in this way, or I think this way, or my brain works this way. And I've also started doing that for my children. Someone the other day when I was saying, you know, I've been having just a really hard week, they were like, do you know Conley's human design? And I was like, tell me more. Let me figure this out. And I think it's just fascinating because while those results or horoscopes or Enneagrams or all those things might not tell us exactly who that person is, if we can even harness just a tiny bit deeper of an understanding of who it is that we are in conflict with or why we are the way we are, I feel like it gives us this level of humanity to approach conflict with a new way of thinking, with a new level of understanding. When we were talking about different Enneagram types, my entire family took the Enneagram. So we are that nerdy family where we're like, dad, pull out your old school cell phone. We're going to load up this test. Let's start answering it. What's been beautiful when I look at like our family structure is that we know how to support each other better based off of knowing more about each other's personality. For example, my sister, She is this personality that she is like always on to the next thing. Like she is so excited about everything. She gets so many ideas. And once I learned this about her, I learned to just celebrate with her instead of challenging these new ideas. She would have a new idea every week. And instead of me being like, wait, I thought last week it was this, or I thought you were excited about this thing. Now I'm like, I'm just going to celebrate you knowing that this might change a week from now, but that you're excited about something and I can be excited for you. And when I learned that my mom is a peacekeeper, and so when I ask her like what she wants for dinner and she says she doesn't care, she really doesn't care. So I need to just stop asking and make the decision. And in learning these things, it not only helps in terms of conflict, but it helps for you to show up for people as their whole selves. I've been thinking a lot about these last two years and some of the challenges that we've faced as a collective population. And one of those challenges that I know I've really encountered, and maybe some of you have too, is that we were not able to compartmentalize aspects of who we were in a way that we could before the pandemic. For those of us who were fortunate enough to begin to work from home or transition to work from home or continue working from home, suddenly we find ourselves wearing all of the roles under one roof. We are parenting from home. We are working from home. We are eating at home. We are cooking at home. We are doing everything in one space. And it's hard to differentiate the Jenna who is recording the Gold Digger podcast, the Jenna who's writing the book, the Jenna who's doing nap time, the Jenna who is the wife. And we started to have to confront this idea of like, who is my whole self? How do I stop trying to compartmentalize aspects of myself? How do I start to just show up and integrate the many facets of who I am as a person? 
And when it comes to conflict, I think a lot of times it's like we want to compartmentalize these little aspects of who we are in our lives so that we can just keep the conflict at bay. But what's beautiful is when you feel safe enough to show up fully and honestly, I feel like conflict can truly bring about positive change and evolution and awareness. So when Drew and I got married, the pastor that married us was the pastor who baptized me and confirmed me. He had known me my entire life. And Drew and I went to our premarital counseling before we got married and we were 22 years old. And I remember we were telling our pastor, we were saying, you know, we love to play cribbage. Does anyone play cribbage? And we have this cribbage board. It's just a board with pegs. And on the back of the cribbage board, we had a little area where we were keeping score of who won more games. It was me. And we were just telling our pastor, like, oh, we love to go sit at Barnes and Noble. We'll grab Starbucks. We'll play cribbage. This is like our thing, which is hilarious because we don't do it enough. And I remember, I don't remember a lot about our wedding day. I feel like it was an entire blur. But I remember this one part of the pastor's sermon on our wedding day. And he said, I know you guys love to keep score, but I want for you to stop that because you are on the same team. And I feel like when we think about conflict, we often forget that like a lot of times we are all on the same team. A lot of times the person you're in conflict with, like you guys want the same thing. You might just be approaching it entirely differently based on who you are or how you feel or how you process or how you communicate. But when you boil it down, a lot of times you want the same thing. You are on the same team. And I feel like with my daughter these days, I'm like, Coco, like we want the same thing. We want the same thing. We're, we got to figure out how to be a better team. Gosh, look at this. Ever, can I make it through a training without crying? I don't know. I, that would be a great thing to keep score on. I think I would lose. But recognizing like, hey, we want the same thing. Like, we both want you to get rest so that you can have energy again. And we both want peace because it feels so good to feel peace in our lives. And I think about that line in our sermon because I'm like, conflict is really just a way for us to be reminded like we want the same thing often. Not always, but often. And so I want for you to think about when you are in conflict, is the person that you're in conflict with a teammate? Are they a team member? Treat them like one. They're not your opponent. A lot of times the people that we are battling against are people that want the best for us. So here's a really great exercise that I learned about when discovering and talking about conflict. So this is a seven minute writing exercise that can change your life. And don't worry, I will run through our list one more time. So there's this fascinating experiment. Couples were made to spend seven minutes writing about their most recent dispute. Like I'm talking about like, get out the timer, seven minutes. And you're going to write about the most recent dispute, but you're going to write about it from the perspective of an imaginary third party who wants the best outcome for everyone involved, right? Let's be like the bird's eye view. Let's be the toddler watching mom and dad process the conflict. What is that third party seeing? Set a timer for seven minutes, write about the most recent dispute. Now, couples who repeated this exercise every four months, so really just like think about, I mean, even if you did it quarterly, that would be amazing. They reported feeling less upset about any arguments and did not experience the slow loss of satisfaction that typically occurs with couples over time. And I love that because I feel like a lot of times we lead through conflict with emotion, right? There's not always logic involved. Logic usually follows after, hopefully is coupled with an apology. But I love this idea of thinking about what does this look like to a third party who genuinely wants the best for us? And how can I start to take on the imagination of a mediator when it comes to conflict, so that I can show up with that humility and understand on a deeper level with empathy. 
So there's one more tool that I want to share, and it's called the 40-20-40 rule. So this is a rule by Dr. Grant Brenner, and he's a psychiatrist, and he says this is one of the best ways to resolve conflict. And I've been trying this. I've been trying it really hard. So you give yourself and the other person 40%, and I'll explain this, and you give the relationship 20%. So 40 for me, 20 in the middle, 40 for the other person. Rather than litigating the problem and making the other person wrong, this tool can help people feel heard and can hear the other party. So the 40% on either side of the equation represents what we each feel, think, and experience in a conflict. So for example, if this is Drew and myself, I get 40%, he gets 40%. The 20% in the middle is where you meet your partner and come up with a plan to move forward. Now, what I think is so important about this is a lot of times when we're in conflict, we can get so in our own zone and world about what is happening to us that we forget about our teammate. And when we don't really show up and have understanding of why they are the way they are or why they are processing the way they're processing or why they're frustrated in the way that they are, it really is hard to bridge that gap and get to that 20% where we can give that relationship the attention it deserves so that it cannot move on from conflict, but start to move forward. And so when we think about how we can do this, the final thing that I want to share is this. I statements are really powerful. I have learned how to argue a little bit better by saying I statements. I feel this way when this thing happens. When you do this, it makes me feel this way. No one can tell me I'm not feeling something, right? So even when I'm not rational, if I'm feeling something, that is an honest reflection of what I'm experiencing. And I statements can be super helpful when you're talking about how you feel in a situation. But I want for us to remember this follow-up to that. When it is time for you to bridge that gap, when it is time for you to meet in the middle at that 20%, I want for you to move to a unified we. I want for you to remember we are a team. We likely want the same things. We might not be going about this the same way. We might process differently. But when you change it from I statements to we statements, It can literally be like that feeling when you plant your feet on the floor and you're like, we are in this together. We are grounded in knowing that we are going to move forward from this together. And so I statements are wonderful as you are in the emotional phase of a conflict. But when we get to the logic and the resolution, I want to challenge you to change to we. So let me review my seven pieces, and then we'll close this out. So number one is protect your peace. If something is costing you your peace, it is too expensive. How can you start to move forward in a way that allows for resolution? Number two is how do you process best? Really take some time while you're not in conflict. Trust me, it'll be much easier while you're not in conflict to ask yourself, how do I process best? Knowing that I'm someone who likes to quickly resolve things brings about a self-awareness and an understanding that maybe someone processes differently and I need to have the grace and compassion to allow that. Number three is practice intentional listening. Again, a great tool to invite into your life when you are not in conflict so that when you are in conflict, it comes naturally to you. How do you communicate best? Have that conversation with somebody that you love. Ask them. You know, does texting during an argument, how does that make you feel hot, cold? You might have a great conversation come about that like Drew and I did. What does resolution look like? Get really honest. Is this a repairable relationship? Is the relationship going to have to look different moving forward? What does an honest resolution look like for you in a way that serves you best? Next, how do we harness humility? How can you just show up as a human being, this imperfect, growing, evolving human being with humility to say, I got it wrong. I might not always get it right, but I'm going to try to do better. And then lastly, 
How can you have a deeper understanding of the person that you are in conflict with? What tools can you invite into your life that introduce opportunities for conversations that help for you to understand the person that you love or the person that you have to deal with or the person that you are working with so that you have a deeper understanding of why they are the way they are so that you can show up with a greater empathy. Now, the last thing that I've been repeating to myself over and over again is that we are a team, whether it's an internal conflict or an external conflict. A lot of times when we look at the end goal, we can come back home to ourselves. We can stop taking score. We can flip the cribbage board over and say, let's just keep playing together and doing the best we can. And remember that we are all doing the very best we can. Ooh, these trainings. I look forward to them every single month. Being a part of this platform and being a member of this community has been truly transformative to me. And it has truly challenged me and stretched me as a leader every single month. I love sharing what's going on behind the scenes, what I'm learning, what I am studying. And I hope that this invites you to think about conflict in a new way or to manage and resolve conflict with new tools in your toolkit. If you want to join us on Growth Day, I coach live once a month on various different topics, and you can try it out for free for 15 days at growthday.com slash Jenna. That's growthday.com slash Jenna. Join me and the thousands of members of that incredible community as we dig into personal development, because as Brendan Burchard says, every day is a good day to grow. Until next time, gold diggers, keep on digging your biggest goals. And thank you so much for listening to another episode of the podcast. I'm over here giving you a virtual high five because you just finished another episode of the Gold Digger podcast. Did that go by way too fast for anyone else? If you want more, head over to golddiggerpodcast.com for show notes and all the discount codes from today's sponsors. And if you're looking for a new crew of movers and shakers like you to bounce ideas and ask questions, be sure to join my exclusive community for gold diggers on Facebook. The link's waiting for you at golddiggerpodcast.com. 